Tangy, do you like free stuff? Nah, bro. The only good things in life are the things you pay for. What about you, Snoke? Me? I love free stuff. Ah, well, I have just the place for you then. Guidebook Gaming. They give away Class 1 or 2 tiles daily. Wow! You gotta tell me more. Guidebook Gaming is the only daily Earth 2 Twitch stream. Every day they are on for an hour or more covering all Earth 2 news, updates, and sales stats. Now that sounds amazing. Yeah, it is. And they have a large active community as well to talk about life on Earth 2 and Earth 1. I I'm in. Where do I go? Twitch.tv slash Guidebook Gaming. Guidebook Gaming. Go there if you like free stuff. Or even if you don't. Welcome to the My Name is Human podcast brought to you by MyNameIsHumanPod.com. I am Aaron. I am Cole. And I am Cody. And today we have a very special guest who we've been hoping to have for quite some time, Janine Yorio. She is the co-president of Republic Rome, a metaverse investment and innovation platform. Janine, welcome to the show. And please tell us a little bit more about your background as well as your current role with Republic. Sure. So I'm so happy to be here, guys. This is fun. Um, my background is in traditionally in investments. Um, I worked on Wall Street and then I worked in a private equity firm and I was a partner there. About four years ago, I started a fintech app that was actually acquired by Republic focused on real estate investing. Um, and during the founding of that company, a bunch of the people that worked with me got really excited about Decentraland and started talking about it. You know how things at the office happen where people are excited about things that don't really have much to do with what you're doing day to day, but it just becomes this motif of conversation. And we watched Decentraland very curiously kind of go from an idea and then all of a sudden their tokens started trading and people started buzzing about the market cap and a colleague of mine had bought a parcel of land for nothing and then all of a sudden it was worth something. And then last, last fall, everybody started buzzing about NFTs. And so it was that confluence of events and my background in building investment technology apps that led us all, my team and I, to conclude, hey, I think there's really something here. I think that it's something that lots of people would want to invest in, but it's really hard to figure out how to do that. Let's make a product that's actually accessible and, and see if it works. So we started Republic Realm sort of as, a, as really just testing a hypothesis. Um, that we had personally, not knowing if other people shared our vision. And then as, as luck would have it, sometimes in life, you're in the right place at the right time. And there was just this groundswell of momentum and, and air in our, or wind in our sails from things like the Beeple sale to um, all of a sudden the central and parcels increasing in value sandbox uh, launched and started doing really well. And then in March, after we launched our vehicle, Axie Infinity started gaining traction. So little by little, there were these things that we never would have foreseen at the outset that happened right place, right time. So we've built this business um, basically launching in March and, and we've been off to the races ever since. We've acquired um, almost 2,000 parcels, individual parcels of land in the metaverse in 11 different metaverses. We've uh, invested in the operating companies as well. And today we're looking at, we have a pipeline of about 70 different investment opportunities and we'll look to deploy capital into probably a handful of those before the end of the year. So we're Great. very active in the metaverse. Um, we're adding new investment products. We're expanding our mandate. I'm so excited about the space. I think it's a tremendous opportunity on so many different levels. And there are so many different things we can talk about today. I'm excited to jump in. Great, great. Cole, will you take question number four? Yeah, yeah. I kind of thought that she answered right. a couple <laughs> of our questions. So, um, so Janine, recently you tweeted about the importance of figuring out what women want from the metaverse, not mm -hmm. just male gamer types. Um, can you elaborate on that and maybe share some examples of platforms that are making positive progress in that regard? So it's so funny you say that. So obviously it resonates with me particularly for obvious reasons. Um, it's, it's hard to tell what gender players are in, in metaverse games because avatars aren't always revealing and, and gamer tags aren't always revealing, but it's still fairly obvious that it's pretty male dominated. Most of the metaverses are built for people that are very crypto native and crypto fluent. And, and that also tends to be primarily male. Um, I think as a result, many of the experiences are either about um, shooting things and killing things, which you guys tend to like, <laughs> or, or they're just neutered. You know, they're, they're about conferences and events. And I think women look to make personal connections, whether they're friends or love connections. And that's sorely missing from, from the metaverse. And I think it's such an obvious reason 
to spend time online. Um, so I think that's one key thing, like building friendships, gossiping, making friends that have shared interests, um, finding mates. I think those are very obvious use cases for the metaverse because the whole point of the metaverse is to make you feel like you're there and to shorten the distance between two people. So like, I don't know where you guys are right now, but I kind of feel like we're all in one room together. And the metaverse right. does that in a way where, you know, we could actually like hold hands or dance or watch a concert. So for me, explored as much as there is a market for it. Um, I think the way the metaverse becomes huge is figuring out how to speak to everybody or to speak to a much larger user base than just gamers and, and crypto enthusiasts. Um, I also personally have this conviction around the thesis because I have two children. One is a boy and one is a girl, and they're both equally addicted to the metaverse. My son is, I mean, I literally have to yank the computers out of their hands. He spends hours a day in Minecraft, which is basically a metaverse. And my daughter plays a game in Roblox called Bloxburg, which is absolutely a metaverse. It's kind of a, a riff on Decentraland and Second Life. Um, and that is how she communicates with her friends. That's where she meets them after school. That's where they talk about whatever it is they talk about. Um, it's where they gossip. It's where they connect. It's where she has her status symbols. So instead of wanting Nike sneakers like we did when we were kids, she wants a dream pet um, or a, I forget what she was asking for money for today, but it was something equally, <laughs> equally crazy. To me. But for her, that's where she's socializing. And that for her is her way of using the Internet. Um, for us, it sounds a little bit nuts. For them, it's completely natural. And that that population of metaverse users who are children today will eventually age out of these juvenile games and they'll want an adult experience. And my, my thesis is the way that we use smartphones and social media is the way that the next generation will use the metaverse. It will just be how they use the internet. And 2D websites will no longer be what they think is, is sufficient, the same way that we don't find a phone book to be a useful way of finding information anymore. So right. that's informed my thesis. And I think the metaverse addressable market is equal male and female. It's as interesting to older people as it is to younger people. So as we figure out how to make the interface much more intuitive for a broader audience and much more attractive on the content side, I think that's when the metaverse explodes. And I like your cat. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Making so, an appearance. And, and he often does. So with the <laughs> anonymity of the internet, Janine, and people not necessarily knowing each other's backgrounds, why is diversity in metaverses still an issue? Because I think diverse teams are better able to figure out what diverse groups of people want. Um, it was funny, we just looked at our pipeline tonight. I, I, I didn't realize you guys were gonna focus on this area, but I just had a call before this call where it was our investment committee and we were looking at all of our investments. And I said, guys, do we have any companies founded by women on this? Or even, you know, even where there's like a woman that shows up on the call. And we came up with one. Um, I think it's called My Name is Alice. It's a, a token-based metaverse, and it's built by a woman. It looks like Animal Crossing. Um, and I oh, think nice. you see that a lot where people take um, formulas that have worked in non-crypto formats, and they're trying to translate them into a crypto-based metaverse, and it looks like that's what she's doing here. But out of a, out of a pipeline of nearly 100 different metaverses of various, at various different stages, we had one with one female founder. And it's not that women are better at the metaverse, but we certainly have a point of view. And um, so do people of color, so do people of different ethnicities, different ages. And I think the metaverse can be as compelling for all these different people if we have insights into what those people want and we'll get them when we bring them onto our team. So it's just, it's something that resonates with me because I've always been, I've often been the only woman in the room in, in many different times in my career and it creates blind spots. And I think the, the metaverse will become huge when, when we figure out how to really speak to the masses. Agree. Right. And so, you know, and, and speaking about that, what proactive steps could these platforms have or take to have broader appeal than the normal young white male? Um, I think it's, it's money. I mean, it's, it's money in two ways. Number one, um, strategic capital that's looking for opportunities that speak to this broader addressable market of which I'm one. I mean, I'm definitely looking for opportunities like this. We're in the process of forming an incubator that would specifically focus on um, alternate use cases for the metaverse. Um, and then it's also following the money on the users. Like everybody knows women buy lots of stuff or we're horrible at saving. So you, you wanna be able to sell us things. And if you can figure out how to do it in the metaverse, we become a very attractive 
customer base. And once there are some successes, then there will be a wave of imitators. So it's just a function of finding one, finding that use case that brings women to the metaverse in droves. And then all of a sudden you guys will start to see the appeal and start building metaverses for us too. So you mentioned money. So that's actually a good kind of transition point because one potential barrier to entry right now is the cost. And Decentraland is kind of an extreme example where, where cost is an obstacle for a new user. Um, and Sandbox is increasingly an example where, where cost is quite a barrier. So do, do you think the metaverse exacerbates or at least kind of demonstrates wealth inequality that we have? Um, it can be hard for, for people to join some of these, I guess is the, my, my core point. Well, in neither, I mean, yes, Decentraland land prices have appreciated, but it's actually free to play. And that's the same case with the sandbox. You do not have to own land in sandbox in order to play. Um, and you do not have to own land in Decentraland in order to play. I think in order to speculate, in order to be the landlord, that's when it starts becoming expensive. And guess what? That's true in the real world too. I don't think we're going to figure out ways to you know, eliminate all inequality today in the metaverse, but the concept of attributing value to these valuable scarce parcels is kind of natural, makes a ton of sense. I'm surprised we didn't do it sooner with, with all video games. And as the prices appreciate, the cost of entry will become prohibitive for some people. But um, as somebody who is, I, I represent one of the largest landowners in many of these games, it is in our best interest to make sure that gameplay is not um, affected by land speculation. We want the content to be as compelling as if land speculation were just happening in the background. And in fact, when we see a metaverse where front and center is the land sale, and the thought of how they're going to actually attract and retain users with content is very secondary, we run. Because land speculation is a flash in the pan and it will not sustain if users are not attracted to the platform and users don't stick around for a very long time. And that's hard to do. You know, you look at the, the best games that have lasted the longest and they've cost a lot of money to create um, and, and they've even had to keep iterating and improving over time to retain their users and issue new versions. And, and so, there, there is a bit of a, a gold rush right now. So we see a lot of imitator metaverses that are trying to do a land sale first. And that for me is a big red flag specifically for that reason. We want users to show up who don't have land and have an awesome time and not feel like they're second class citizens. So 2021 has been a crazy year in the NFT and metaverse space. How has Republic's attitude towards this market changed? Are you more optimistic, less optimistic in terms of risk where would you place something like the Republic Fund? So I would preface it anytime I, I speak to a prospective investor, and for the record, we're closed for investment right now, but um, in speaking to investors historically, we would always say, look, there is a very good chance that there is total loss of principle here. And you should not invest in this space unless you're, care you're comfortable with that. I think even more so than traditional VC, which is very, very risky, this is worse um, because you have crypto plus startup plus land, which is this asset that, you know, people are just now waking up to and figuring out how to value. So it's incredibly risky. That being said, if you look at adoption of um, metaverse or land sales compared to overall crypto ownership, it's still just a tiny drop in the bucket. So even if like one fifth of all Bitcoin owners decided to go out and buy a parcel of land, you'd have dramatic increase in, in market cap and value there. And I think honestly, we're still at the tip of the spear in terms of Bitcoin adoption as well. I think we're gonna see massive adoption of NFTs, largely driven today by how many people have gotten rich quickly. You know, everybody loves to get rich quick, right? It's, it's so seductive <laughs> and people are doing it. Um, and so that will draw a lot of people to the space, but what will keep them there is how much fun it is once you buy an NFT. To, it's like, it makes you feel like a kid again. You know, it's like Christmas and Easter eggs and collecting art and status symbols all wrapped up into one. And by the way, you never have to leave your sofa or brush your hair to do it, you know? So in, in a time when at any given time, we might be locked down again and not able to leave our house and not be able to go to parties, NFT, the NFT party is still raging, you know? And I think that's what has really catapulted it even faster than it would have is, is just this weird pandemic situation that we've all been put in. So I'm very optimistic about NFTs. I think humans are so ingenious and there are so many interesting ways they're gonna figure out how to use this technology, some of which are purely for fun, but I bet we'll figure out really serious use cases as well. Um, and I'm just excited to be a part of it on the ground floor. 
And uh, Aaron, I do think I'll, I'll jump ahead here to the next question, just in the interest of time. Um, so, so you've touched on it a little bit, Janine, but I did want to ask more specifically, how does Republic choose which metaverse and NFT projects to become involved with? And is there a problem right now with, with oversaturation? You described it as a gold rush, so. I, I think there's a gold rush in the sense that there are a lot of um, new entrants into this space, but mm -hmm. some of them are very compelling. Um, just because some of them are not as compelling doesn't mean that there aren't still gems out there. How do we choose? I mean, I would say we use kind of a traditional venture capital model. We look at the competitive landscape. We look at the team. We always do technical diligence. So by being part of Republic, we have a team of in-house blockchain engineers that are able to actually make sure that the team is doing what they say they're going to do. Because as we all know, in crypto, it's not always what it, what they say it is, is not always what it seems. Um, we look at relative valuations. So some of the valuations are quite frankly stupid and we, <laughs> we you know, step back from those. But I also, I, I have a saying, I learned it from one of my old bosses. You're either in the market or you're out, right? And we're in the market and the market today is, is not for the faint of heart, but our job is to deploy capital into this space so that our individual investors can have broad diversified exposure. And that means sometimes taking a bit of a leap and trusting our conviction that we're just at the beginning, the market's going to get bigger, valuations that sound crazy today might end up being actually very conservative when we figure out how this becomes the next Facebook or the next Coinbase or what, whatever the equivalent is for the metaverse. And there will be many. Um, if we're in those companies, even if we buy in at a $25 or $100 million valuation today, if those companies become $10 billion companies, we'll still be glad we were there. So you've touched on some points that are really, so we are basically an Earth 2 podcast, but we do focus on the metaverse a lot. Uh, after Jawad came on, uh, we really appreciated him coming on. You had reached out to me asking to speak to the Earth 2 team about potential investment. You could say there were some difficulties. Uh, did you ever speak with anyone? And given some of the recent negative publicity for Earth 2, what could they do to put themselves in a more positive light for investors such as Republic and the people you represent? So I, I apologize, I was not involved with the Earth 2 diligence process. And, and by the way, I'm, I sit on the investment committee, but when it comes to actually taking deals through the funnel, um, it's usually somebody else on my team. So I'm not privy to, to exactly what happened. I do think, um, and, and I'm going off memory, so I, I disclaim everything I'm about to say by saying I might be confusing you with another, another metaverse platform. But from what I recall, you were one of the platforms that leads with the land sale. Yeah, I do yeah, also I recall that your graphics quality was insanely good and we were all blown away by the animations we saw. So as somebody who um, I think what I like to talk about and what I like to do best is brand building and marketing. I think what you have is a really solid idea and maybe reframing it so that it's a gaming experience. It's going to be massively addictive as opposed to buy my land, buy my land, buy my land. It, it's like, um, I'm trying to think of a good analogy. Like when you run a nightclub, you don't put a sign up and, and you want it to be the hottest nightclub around. You don't put a sign up that says like free beer. You know, it, it, it's, it's like you got to lead with what people really want as opposed to what you want to have happen. And while you want your land prices to appreciate and to sell, what people want is to have this mind blowing experience that takes them away from their real life. And I think you've got to keep that in mind. The metaverses that work are the ones that are really going to figure out how to capture the popular popular imagination such that I'm yanking the computer away from that user. Yeah. By the way, and they're spending money in the metaverse. That's the, that's the second level. Not only are you addicted, but like you're buying things. You're buying things you may never even be able to see in real life. And so the metaverses that understand that, um, I think thinking farther down the line, and you know, this is just me riffing off what I would do if I were launching a metaverse platform. If you look at a company like Slack, the power of Slack, I mean, it's really just text messaging, right? But what they've done really well is the integrations. And thinking about how the metaverse can integrate with other things that people are already addicted to or already need, I think could also be really powerful. Um, there are a host of imitators that have taken the earth and tried to make parcels out of it for the metaverse. So I think distinguishing your platform from theirs is also um, something that, that I, I would need to have sort of in my face because everybody's busy and, and they are overwhelmed, um, but understanding what we can do differently in your metaverse than we can in others, I think would be a big differentiator. But I distinctly remember being blown away by your graphics. 
I remember uh, this video of like running through a forest and, and it looking incredibly photo real. So that part was particularly impressive. So if you figure out the marketing piece and how you get uh, and retain users, I think we would definitely be interested in taking a closer look. Couldn't agree with you more. Uh, absolutely 1000% agree with everything you just said. Uh, Snoke, you want to get our last question, then we'll wrap this up. Yeah, so I mean, are, are there any other projects that you would want to promote? I don't think that's fair to ask me. I mean, there's, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I, I do want to be a bit agnostic. I mean, we do have um, metaverses that we have heavily weighted our investment allocation to, and some of those have been driven by the market, right? Like Decentraland, I feel like any metaverse investment platform today needs to have some exposure to Decentraland, regardless of what you think about it. It's like being a tech ETF and you, know, you have to have some Apple. <laughs> right? um, and, and, I'm, and I'm not in any way equating Decentraland to Apple. I'm just saying it is kind of in the in the index like of metaverse companies that, that we would need to have. Um, I think some of the companies that have thought about how to create content that it's funny listening to my kids when they, they, I try to make them the guinea pigs and play with these metaverses. And they're like, mom, there's nothing to do here. There's nothing <laughs> to do. And there's no reason to do it. And I think thinking through that, as much as we like the idea of second life, having no stated objective, um, there was a, an active economy there. And, you know, again, it became like the real world. You wanted to get rich. And I think figuring out how to give people the opportunity to do things, whether it's kill people um, or build things or, accumulate wealth or I don't know, I don't know what the next thing is, um, but, but I think people do want to do things and the blank canvas can be overwhelming if they have to build it all themselves. We, we, we were trying to throw you a big softball for Fantasy Island, Janine. <laughs> Metaverse, that's just an NFT project that we did in the sandbox. Um, and so it's not, it's a layer, it's not the Metaverse itself, but I appreciate you doing that. Yeah. Obviously, I'm very excited about Fantasy Island. And we'd love to do something. Maybe we do something with you guys. Um, you know, we do try to be somewhat platform agnostic um, and, and be very fair. And I will be honest with you, companies that we passed on investing in, uh, we watched them. In, and it's only been five months since we launched, but we've watched them grow and make strides. And in fact, just today, I sent an email to a company that I passed on and I said, hey, I made a big mistake. Um, I, I want to take a look right now. And I eat my words. I hope you'll respond to me. P.S. They did not respond to me. I did just send the email today and, and I am, I'm the first person to admit, I definitely don't know everything. We're also just honestly bandwidth constrained. So, um, you know, just because you don't hear back from us, it doesn't, it, sometimes I'm doing stuff like this instead of doing, uh, you know, investment research. <laughs> you guys well, we, we what? I'll go ahead. No, I'm sorry. No, what do you guys do at Earth 2 besides the podcast? So we oh. buy land, uh, we, <laughs> and so it's actually changed a little bit. They do have some game elements starting to come out. They have, uh, they have, uh, you can trade jewels. You, uh, they have some different, I'm not going to get into a lot of details about that, but they're starting to roll out the game elements slowly, but surely. I, and I think towards the end of this year, I think it'll be something that you might be more interested in right now. It's still definitely more more it's land driven more and also resource driven a little bit uh with the jewels and everything from that side great and but what is your role do you guys um, work, work so we're actually unaffiliated <laughs> like directly. i mean we are we are some of the early folks you know making content uh i guess ultimately on their behalf but no we're a third party so we're able to remain you know objective with some of the you know announcements that are made and whatnot. Right, and That's we do so we cool. do we do run a new site uh, talking specifically about Earth Two, but like we have a real interest in just not just Earth Two in the metaverse, which is why I reached out to you when you had that tweet about women in the metaverse because that's something that has always been an interest of mine, having been in poker and daily fantasy sports, very male dominated industries, and I see that same trend with metaverses. And it's not a trend I like, actually. I, I want women involved in these spaces. I want minorities involved in these spaces. So to, bringing you on to talk about that was exciting for me. Well, I, there was a quote that uh, I think my colleagues excerpted. I said it in Digiday, and it said, women don't, or I said, nobody wants to be in a metaverse that 
is only men. I mean, no offense, but you know, we all, <laughs> it's like, it's like walking into a bar and it's all men. I mean, I guess certain bars that's intentional, but most bars want to have a little bit more equity. And so I think figuring out how to get women there and get people of all ages there is really core to making the metaverse more than just an idea. Great. I agree. Well, Janine, anything else, Janine? Uh, we've really enjoyed you being on the show. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, anything you want to add before we wrap things up? No. Um, yeah, definitely a plug for Fantasy Island, although we sold out in 24 hours. So there's really I know. I, I saw unless, that. Unless you want to buy one on the secondary, uh, they're trading on OpenSea, but um, we're going to do lots of exciting things with that um, that brand and um, just excited to keep moving and, and keep building the metaverse. All right. Well, thank you so much. for On behalf of Cody and Cole, my name is Aaron. This has been the My Name is Human podcast brought to you by MyNameIsHumanPod.com. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Get up off your knees, girl Get up. Stand face to face with your God oh God, And find out what you are Hello, my name is Human Hello, my name is Human And I came